Here we go. Yes. All right, guys. So I have only 20 minutes, and I can talk about it for three hours. So um, <laughs> if you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. More than happy to spend time with you uh, about this very fascinating topic. So first of all, welcome to Galvanize. My name is Nir. I'm the head of data science and managing our enterprise corporate training departments at Galvanize. Galvanize is the learning community for technology. We provide education in data science, data engineering, and software engineering both for the public, so students are coming in to our campuses. We have eight campuses across the US. Uh, we train them in state-of-the-art um, skills and tech te uh, technology. And then we actually measure ourselves by um, how much of them um, got a job by graduation. On the enterprise side, we work with very large enterprises. Uh, I mainly focus on Fortune 100 companies, helping them transform their organization to become data-driven, uh, agile, and nimble, so they can actually survive in these fourth industrial revolution, which we call the artificial intelligence one. So um, I'm going to talk quickly about um, AI adoption among Fortune 500 companies and what I've seen working with these very large conglomerates in the past um, year and a half. So it's very clear that, oops, uh, it's very clear that it's time to take to get very serious about artificial intelligence um, as it's actually transforming the entire industries. We talk about um, healthcare to gaming, to finance, to um, you know, social um, and, and so forth. But it's time to get serious about it, not because of just the major transformation, it's also because it's now time that we can actually look back at early adopters, see what they did, how they actually invested, and what is their respective ROI behind the initial investment. So it's true that if we talk about um, business innovation or currently how companies are actually leveraging machine intelligence technology to drive business um, uh, innovation, we can look at companies like Facebook, like Google, like Amazon, Tesla, and they're all relying on data science and, and, and machine learning to drive business experience, user experience, enhance the business and get more revenue. We can talk about companies like Amazon that is basically is a gigantic supply chain company. And what they did is basically perfect each part of the chain with machine learning and machine intelligence technology to drive the business forward. Uh, we can talk about uh, Facebook that actually did something similar on content recommendation for um, for um, advertisement and recommending content to, um, to users. So these companies are very well known um, in the space, but this is like how things are actually happening today. And the most interesting question to talk about um, is what's going to happen in the future. So we argue that the future of business innovation is an artificial intelligence component and this very core structure of the business. And to give you some examples, we can talk about companies like Nest. So I guess everyone is familiar with this smart thermostat, right? Um, it's beautifully designed, that's true. But the entire monetization behind the product is basically by his intelligence, right? You plug it in, you play with it for two weeks, you give it some cues, it connects to your phone, uh, your phone connects to the right router, he knows when you come home, he knows what's the temperature outside. You collect all of this data and basically after two weeks it can actually provide you the temperature um, without even touching it. So this is kind of like Amazon Echo, obviously, and Pandora that started with the Genome Project 15 years ago are kind of like the companies um, that are marching this revolution forward. Now, I encourage you to think how you, uh, within your capacity, within your, within your organization, can actually create product that has artificial intelligence or machine, in, machine intelligence embedded as the very core structure of the business. But there are some very major notable gaps, uh, and these are very um, clear ones. And I want to share with you some that I actually um, personally have interacted with and few that I'm actually trying to and help to kind of like mitigate and close. One of them is that, you know, Fortune 500 companies have a lot of data and they have a lot of money. Uh, but still, when we actually look at AI adoption, or call it machine intelligence adoption, or even machine learning adoption, we see that it's too slow. And if we actually think about the implementation of this technology, again, all of these companies can recruit um, talent. They have a lot of money to, you know, to implement this technology infrastructure. Why can't they actually realize the ROI? 
um, what is the problem there? And the question is, whether it's a data problem? What do you think? It is a data problem. We talk about Fortune 500 companies. It's no. They operate for many, many years, right? They have tons of data. Do you think it's a technology problem? Do they have a problem, an issue to reach out to IBM and kite a six or ten billion dollar deal to put the, infra the, to put the uh, technology infrastructure in place? The question is no. They are very, very wealthy, right? So what is the problem then? If it's not data or technology, which, by the way, most executives will blame either of those, right? What is the problem? Why? Say it again. Skills. The skill set. Skill set. So again, we talk about Fortune 500 company. Do you think that they have a hard time to recruit talent? Well, there are talents, but not enough talent. OK, so there is, maybe we can argue that there is a talent gap. Fair enough, yeah. Um, although, say it again. Return, return of investment. Return, OK. Um, although we've seen from early adopters that the return is actually very high, right? It's around <coughs> 20, I didn't put the numbers here because I don't have time, but the number is around 25% uplift in revenue. That's, that's changing business, right? That's a lot. So what is the problem if it's not data or technology? Go ahead. So it's a new thing. So you know, usually in Fortune 500 company, mm -hmm. management is very risk averse of trying mm -hmm. something that's new until you don't get fired for trying to. Right. It's kind of a new thing, although we have been talking about it for 60 years, right? <laughs> Um, but you, you said something right. There's some issue with management, which I'm going to talk about it in just a second. Yeah. It's like job security. Okay, job security. So you think people are afraid from AI, and therefore they. Okay. By the way, I don't have time to talk about it, but I don't think that AI will replace the human. Next. <laughs> <laughs> a lack of vision on the problem they're trying to solve. Right? Okay. So Basically, translating the business problems into data problems. <laughs> That's what you... Yeah, the vision of, like, I think a lot of people want to go into AI because it's like seeing uh -huh. everything, but they're not completely sure how to apply it. Like, what is right. the problem they're trying to solve, mm -hmm. and where would it be applicable for okay. to do business? Fair enough. Fair. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Sure. The problem with deep learning fundamentally, one, is the data set size will be very large. Mm -hmm. Second thing is having accurate data model with the data, one-to-one -one relationship. Decay, you need to clean it up really well before you can get a correct model. <laughs> so what they do, the TensorFlow is not new because it mm -hmm. has been around 50 years. Right. So image recognition or doc is very easy to do. But this doesn't apply to everything like cat recognition and bread. That's not work because the mm -hmm. feature set is very small. So you're not having the same even making technology apply to everything else. It over exaggerate if learning can do different because what happens is data set clinic part is uh, I agree, and there are some shortcomings for <coughs> using machine learning. One of them is cleaning the data, labeling the data, putting in the right structure. But I don't think that Fortune 500 companies have issues with that. Not necessarily, right? They have the data, they can reallocate resources <coughs> to make it in the right shape, right? Yeah, go ahead. Privacy concerns. If I'm a major mm -hmm. company, I yeah. know that, you know, Technology can be hacked into, computers communicate to each other. I'm going to be concerned about my data being linked. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one of them. So let me suggest to you another one. Is it maybe a people and a culture issue rather than data or technology? Right? And I think this is kind of like touch your point on that. So the truth is that. Not all Fortune 500 companies were born data-driven, like Amazon, Google, Facebook, or Tesla, right? The companies that you see here. And that's a big problem. Can you tell me why? Do you have any idea why not being a fully data-driven company can actually kind of like yeah, be a barrier? Change, you try to make in that yeah. thousand hundred people that have mm -hmm. to, to join your initiative. So it takes a lot of friction. Yeah. Change. Yeah. Say it again? Yeah. So think about it like that. Your organization needs to become and be very data driven so it can actually best respond to all the predictions that are coming from these great models very fast, right? If the organization is not nimble and can actually adopt quickly, you will not be able to realize and see the true ROI behind the initial investment, even though you have the data you have the talent and you have the technology infrastructure. So this is one of the biggest issues here. And we 
argue that um, implementation of AI technology required a change management. And I want to talk about it in just a second and kind of like link it to the data science workflow. And the second one is organization needs to become data driven again so it can actually best respond to all what is coming from, from these very sophisticated models. So let's talk about the first one, um, the change management in the AI era. So here I kind of like really quickly high level um, demonstrate to you the data science workflow, kind of like A to Z. Uh, again, very macro level. You start from asking great questions and basically <coughs> translating your business problems into data problem, and then you're acquiring the data, as that the guy there said, you're making it in the right shape, it takes time, and then you analyze the data, and then you basically needs to act on that. So there is nothing new in this data science workflow. What is new here is that it requires an end-to-end -end change management. So look at the bottom of the slide here. Uh, the first one, you have a lot of like, business people, right? Executives and managers. Um, and then it goes to technical people and then goes back to management again. So these two components have to work um, together in a very seamless way. Now, that's very new. Like if you think about Harvard Business School, Harvard Business School didn't graduate MBAs that knows how to actually create a model that both technical and non-technical people knows how to work very closely together. Most engineers don't know how to talk to marketers and vice versa, right? Uh, we don't try to blame anyone, but in this fourth industrial revolution, we need to figure out how to bring those technical and non-technical teams to work closely together. Um, which is again one of the largest gap from implementation perspective. So if you think about this generic kind of like cycle, you start with you know data scientist or analyst, um, and then goes back to big product and business, and then again to um, um, technical people and so forth. So this kind of like change management is a completely new thing that the organization needs to start figuring it out. If they figure it out, not yet. Um, but there are some companies, and I wish I had more time to describe what these companies are actually doing. What they're doing, just in a nutshell, is basically to create a middleman, someone who understands the business and the business objectives, and that will hold his, you know, one hand the business side, and on the other hand, he will hold the technical people, right? So kind of like figure out a middleman that put these two together until the gap will actually become um, um, narrower over time. But a change management is vital and it's actually vital from day one. If you embark a pro on a project in machine learning or AI without thinking about this change management, you probably will not be able to realize the ROI by the end of it. Because if you start thinking about it by the end, um, it's going to be very, very problematic to organize all of these pieces um, and then implement it quickly. So change management is vital and you have to think about it from day one. Now, the second thing is data-driven organizations. Now, again, not all Fortune 500 companies are fully data-driven and that's a problem because we know that the winners in this fourth industrial revolution will be companies who are actually realizing the ROI and, being, and implementing this technology. So let me ask you a few questions and I always ask this um, I do this training for executives as well. So I ask them, what is a data-driven organization? You hear it all over the time. Um, what do you think is a data-driven organization? Organization that makes its, um, decisions based on customer data. Okay, organization that makes decisions on data. That's 98% correct. Um, what is the 2% that missing, is missing? And by the way, 100% of the people that I presented this presentation so far said exactly what you, but what is the missing? point here. It's one word. <coughs> you are definitely in the right direction. So for the sake of time, you need to make all of your business decisions based on data, right? Um, I'm not talking about if you should go to the restroom, I'm talking about the purely business decisions. And a fully data-driven organization is basically an enterprise that cultivates the culture of using data and machine intelligence to make all business decision um, based on data. Now, why data-driven organization? I think I just told you before, your organization needs to be agile, be nimble, and best response to the predictions. But why it's so hard to become a data-driven organization? Why Fortune 500 cannot wake up tomorrow morning and say, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm a data-driven organization. Uh, what's the issue there? Can you, can you give me an example of like the 
come because I'm having a hard time in trying to mm -hmm. uh, take your statement that Fortune 500 are not data driven. Mm -hmm. so Just can somehow. Can you give me an example of which company are not data driven? Um, well, I work with uh, most of them, <laughs> so it's going to be problematic, but example, I think about banking. Amazon, Facebook. UK, yeah, I think uh, so Amazon is currently the leading data driven. There is a data, there is a data driven index, actually. Uh, it's a public information. You can see Amazon is four Facebook point. Facebook is so data driven that they, they didn't care. About yeah, it. think about incumbents, right? Okay. Um, it's recorded. I don't want to say names, but think about traditional automobile, traditional banking. Think about traditional insurance. So you're talking about the bot, like the bottom quartile of the for, uh, Fortune 500. What do you mean the bottom? I'm actually speaking about the very first. Apple. Think about Fortune 5. Among Fortune 5, I can I can say two. So what happens is that these large companies are innovating in a mm -hmm. space where there's no data out there mm -hmm. to say, oh, that's the future. And that is sometimes where the problem is. I mm -hmm. work for one of those mm -hmm. very large companies that we are building stuff three years down the road and there's nothing to go mm -hmm. uh, around with it. So, Although yeah. they sit on a lot of data. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> do you get the direction here? Think about uh, traditional. About <laughs> you know what? Off camera, I will, I will give you some names. <laughs> I, I don't want to waste your time. It's OK. Um, Let's chat afterwards. So, so why do you think it's a uh, it's hard to become a data-driven organization? What are the some some of the barriers there? Silos. Sure. Silos. Okay. Culture. Say it again. Culture. Culture. Yeah. Sense of, the sense of you're losing control. Mhm. Mm okay. What else? That's good. So typically, I I'm in a room with full of executives of this organization, and I always say, you know, it's really all about you. So one of the biggest issues that we have is actually with management. Um, and I don't have the slide here how management is actually looking, uh, currently looking, but think about it. Managers uh, and executives are fear from information. They are, we are not accustomed to, make, to solve problems with data, right? And there is a lot of ignorant, ignorance, lack of patience, which is con completely orthogonal to the patience that you need from you know, actually training all of this model, right? It's like, it's a process. So management is one of the biggest issues. and. Um, and no, that's, that's absolutely true. If I, I, I'm, I'm saying it out loud, it's not a data problem, it's not a people problem, it's our problem, it's, it's a people problem. So that's one of the issues there, but um, leave this aside for now. I wanna show you um, how organization can actually transform to a data-driven organization. There are six principles that we have been evangelizing and actually uh, over the past year and a half working with lots of large companies um, to implement them and these six principles actually became very, very successful. So um, where you start? You start from your strategy. You need to figure out how to create and design a roadmap um, on how to leverage data um, that you have. You have to start thinking about data as a strategic asset, as gold opportunity on the table. And this mindset is kind of like lacking, um, you know, at the non-data driven companies. And executives actually needs to start marching with that. This is a very, this is an executive, you know, problem, right? So um, typically I give the example here of um, DJ Patil, which actually did a great job um, uh, in the Obama administration literally forcing the government to treat data as a strategic asset and figure out how to leverage that uh, to enhance policy. And he actually really did a great job on that. The second thing is you need to democratize your data. Now, someone says security, so let's think about it in a banking perspective or insurance perspective. You can open the door to everyone in the organization, right? You have to be smart on that. So how about you start democratizing your data by figuring out what are the relevant um, what are the roles and the relevant decisions that these people are actually doing? And then share with them the data, right? Because we know the data-driven decisions tend to be better decisions. So instead of like just opening the gates uh, for everyone in the organization, how about we identify roles, we identify what decisions they are making, and share with them the right data to support these decisions. Now, a company that did a great job with that was actually um, Airbnb, is actually Airbnb that basically created a platform 
where firstly the platform can handle you know and route the data across the entire organization but there is governance and hierarchy there and you can actually look at the metadata look at the specific relevant data for the relevant um, people to make the decision and this basically enhances decision making in the organization the third one is all about culture so you need to create a data science and analytics culture and what I mean is that leaders need to create habits and incentivize employees to look at data at the point of action. The idea here is how you actually bring data and decision very close to each other. Now, you know, you can do um, competitions. There's many, many ways in companies actually becoming very creative, how they actually incentivize their employees to um, look at data uh, at the point of action. And again, we talked about it, but we really need to figure out how to bring closer non-technical and technical people um, um, to really realize the ROI and actually Google did some a great job there. Um, but I will keep going. The fourth one is speed to insight. You need to figure out how to create kind of like dynamic dashboards that everyone in the organization will be able to get a snapshot from the data organization before they make a decision. Um, Uber actually took it a step for the, further and created machine learning as a service. Think about it as uh, IBM Watson. You basically take your data, you drag it to the right side, you press on three buttons, and then you have a prediction from the model. The idea here is basically democratizing machine learning. Not everyone in the organization needs to know how to code in, actually, in order to actually see predictions from smart models. The fifth one is about actions. You need to make sure that data science is a valuable and crucial business KPI and also to prioritize investment with the highest data ROI. I spend a lot of time working with CDOs, chief data officers and chief information officers at a very large organization. And one of the problems is that they have hundreds of thousands of requests to embark on data science and machine learning projects. So how, you, how they should think about it? So one interesting way to think about it is in terms of feasibility versus impact. Um, and think about what I encourage you is before you actually reach out to your CIO or CDO, hey, I have this project, think to yourself, what is the feasibility of this project? This is a low, medium, high. Do you have the data? You don't have the data. Um, what is the impact on the organization? What is low impact, mid impact, high impact on the organization? That's kind of like really help organization um, figure out what is the roadmap from which project they should embark on um, at first. And then obviously number six is mastering security and um, uh, uh, privacy and you know, governance in general. Unfortunately, again, I work with a large, uh, even insurance companies that sometimes I'm shocked that data governance and you know, security is, in 2018 is not fully set, right? Um, so if you think about in a recap on all of these six um, principles, um, this can actually help organization transform, start transforming itself into data driven. Obviously there is a culture change here, the executive needs to march, the executive need to champion data, right? Um, but again, the message that I want to send you that it's not a data problem, it's not a technology problem, it's purely a people problem. And sometimes the people are we, executives. So I'll just finish by kind of like give you the data maturity horizons. Um, it's not going to happen in a day. Um, but the gap will eventually narrow um, over time. You start with yourself. You ask, start yourself with asking what you know instead of what you think. You know, we know that successful companies are companies or data-driven companies are companies that are asking itself, what do we um, what do we know instead of what we think the future holds? Uh, looking at data rather than on gut feeling. And then you start leveraging the data that you have. You know, most people actually say, yeah, I cannot do machine learning or AI because I don't have the data. It's the easiest thing to blame. But start with what you have because you already have a lot. Again, think about in the context of Fortune 500 companies, they sit on tons of data. So start training yourself start looking at what you already have before actually blaming the entire ecosystem. Then start promoting utilization of data across the organization, basically share the wins. Uh, and then the last one is you contribute um, to a wide um, uh, data platform across the entire organization where actually the data is well democratized 
and you have access to it um, in an instant manner. So um, I think that sums up, right? My 20 minutes. If you have more questions, that is really a snapshot um, of the executive trainings that we actually do with the Fortune 200 companies, uh, sometimes Fortune 500 companies. Um, really, the idea here is to help them transform their organization to become data-driven, to become agile and nimble so they can actually survive um, in this fourth industrial revolution. And thank you for coming for Galvanize. We're happy to host you. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Paul Longlin. Uh, I'm here from Toronto, Canada, uh, where it's quite a bit more cold, so I don't have to wear my winter boots here. It's quite nicer here, even though it feels kind of cold for California weather, I think. Um, so today I'll be talking uh, about this AI talent problem. So uh, Nir talked a lot about, um, I think, the people, the culture problem when it comes to AI in enterprises, especially in the Fortune 500. Uh, today I'll be talking a little bit more about the skills side of things uh, when it comes to data science skills and uh, how that kind of works in enterprise organizations. So um, I'm, I, I guess a little bit more about myself. Uh, I'm a data scientist at IBM and uh, I focus on, uh, I guess, much of the education and partnership side of things. Um, so I'll jump right into to this uh, presentation. So uh, we, we've seen for uh, for the past couple of years uh, that data science and data engineering skills are still extremely high in demand. And we see this across the board from you know job um, postings uh, all the way to different kinds of charts and news articles that you know data scientists are still very much high in demand, but there's still uh, not enough of these data scientists um, to for, uh, to be employed. So there's uh, in essence there's two problems uh, when it comes to uh, this AI talent pool. Uh, number one is for many different organizations, uh, the first problem is you know hiring data scientists with a proper amount of skill and subject matter expertise is very, very difficult, especially uh, when we're not talking about, let's say, Fortune 100 or Fortune 500 companies. Um, so many, many organizations out there are having trouble finding the right skill set when it comes to data scientists who actually happen to know the same industry that the company is in as well. So the second part is, you know, is there some way that we can perhaps train the existing employees in, ex in their organization and find a way to upskill these employees so that they can become uh, data scientists since they already have a lot of that domain expertise. So this is the second problem that we're kind of trying to solve within uh, our team at IBM. And our team at IBM has created this, this kind of skills network called Conduct to Class. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But it's kind of reflected uh, mainly around um, lots of content around data science uh, and providing skills to employees and students around the world. And it's revolved around um, this concept of MOOCs. Uh, so MOOCs, if you're familiar with, these are these online courses that are available. Uh, m many times these are for free. And uh, there's this uh, article that came out on the uh, Harvard Business Review in actually just last month, um, so January 2018. And the question was, can MOOCs solve your training problem? And so the, the author you know, found in a study across, I think, 10 a thousand different organizations, they found that about 67% of employed learners said they would apply their knowledge from these MOOCs and skills in their current jobs and companies. So there is some potential for them, uh, for, for employees to gain the right skills uh, in order to apply that to the existing companies. But there's not a lot of support from their employers. So only 5% receive financial help and only management, you know, uh, not a lot of management is recognizing uh, that kind of learning time as, as really valuable time. And so this is, uh, a reoccurring kind of situation that we find ourselves in when we go out to some of our clients um, with IBM, and uh, one of the first questions that you know that comes up is you know the CFO would say something like, "What happens if we invest in developing our people, and they go somewhere else? Right? They leave the organization and they they go somewhere else because then they can apply their skills to a different organization." And then the CEO would kind of respond, "You know, what happens if we don't, and they stay?" <laughs> so there's a bit of a conundrum there, right? And if you reflect back to, you know, for those of you who, have, you know, who are familiar with the S-curve, technology S-curve from Clayton Christensen, um, you don't want to ever be in a position where you're kind of at the, kind of, you're improving the product, but it's not really making significant gains. So you want to be always learning new skills and developing and, and, and kind of fostering innovation within a company. Um, so, so kind of developing the skills within an organization so that it creates a culture of learning and culture of innovation is really, really fundamental to kind of what we're trying to solve at IBM, at least within our team. When it comes to data science, um, you know, data science is emerging, it's, it's high in demand, but the skill set involved in data science is just tremendous. And this is a, a diagram aboard from um, the internet 
uh, that looks at all the different kinds of skills that are potentially relevant to um, a, a data scientist. So going from you know, data visualization to simple programming to working with databases to machine learning to deep learning, uh, all sorts of different things that data scientists are expected to know nowadays. And this is just tremendous amount of knowledge that, that that's really hard to kind of um, grasp. And, and that's kind of the reason why we have lots of different online courses and even Galvanize here today is because um, there's just such a, such a large demand for these, for these skill sets. So what we've done is we've created this um, kind of skills network called cognitiveclass.ai. We've created our own sets of courses and we've also brought in a lot of different partners and experts in the industry to create a lot of these courses that are online uh, and they have you know, videos. But we also have you know, this, this kind of concept that, especially in data science, when you learn something, let's say through videos around TensorFlow, you don't really learn it until you actually apply that knowledge that you're learning. So we embed a lot of our uh, lab exercises directly within our courses so that you know, all the students and all the learners can, can practice what they're learning through the videos. And there's assessments and everything like that to make sure that they're uh, you know, learning what they, we, we think uh, they should learn. And we've kind of, um, kind of taken this and kind of made it available to our clients as well. So what we've done was we've essentially created a portal for, for our clients who really feel they need um, that skills for their employees by creating a portal for them. So this is a fictitious university uh, called the University of Antarctica. So there isn't one, um, but uh, we've created one just to, as a sample. But the idea is that this client or this institution would be able to take any of these courses and also be able to customize it so that their employees can learn in that particular domain uh, or skill set that the industry really kind of needs. So for example, let's say you're in the banking industry and you have some courses or th that you want your employees to, to take around data science, but you don't really, you're not really fond of some of the, you know, some of the materials that, that we teach. So you can change that up and, and be able to um, make that relevant to the particular industry. So for example, um, as an administrator of this particular portal, for example, as, as a client, you'll be able to pull from any of these courses that are existing that we have from uh, either IBM or from our partners. Um, you'll be able to customize in the content, you know, point to different videos, point to different lab exercises, use different data sets. Um, and another part of learning is, uh, and, we'll f and for those of you who are aware of our upcoming meetup on Thursday as well, is you know, competitions. So especially in data science, this is uh, a really great way of learning is to be able to compete with others. Um, and we, we find that you know, hackathons are really popular, datathons are really popular, but we also find that a lot of different companies don't really want to share their data and be able to share their problems outside in the world. So we've created a way to be able to uh, host your own private hackathons or even private datathons so that that can be you know, completely in a controlled environment that only certain employees perhaps would see. And we'd make that available to these clients as well. And we also recognize that you know, MOOCs may not be the entire answer really because you know, online courses, um, they're, they're great to you know, self-learn. Uh, self you know, people can take these courses on their own time. There may not be a you know, dedicated time schedule and everything like that when it comes to learning. But um, a lot of times, um, employees also need a little bit of extra help when it comes to learning via these, uh, these courses. So we've also developed a, a boot camp, uh, a data science boot camp. It's a four, four or five day long boot camp where it goes from everything from introduction to Python all the way up to, or, or R, uh, all the way up to data analysis, data visualization, machine learning, big data, and deep learning. And we try to get a, an organization up, uh, up to speed when it comes to data science. And combining that with self-guided kind of education through these online courses, I think that hybrid learning environment is really the key to kind of developing the skills within an organization. So I think, uh, well, it's, um, if you're interested in, in you know, taking one of these courses, our courses, uh, many of them are available. Uh, many of them are limited to just our clients. Uh, but if you're interested in a portal, if you're interested in one of these boot camps, you're welcome to find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I think there's only one of me out there, uh, at least with my name, Polong Lin. Um, and if you're interested in just taking one of these courses just, just to see what it's like, uh, you can go to cognitiveclass.ai and we have over 50 courses and they're all related to emerging technologies and they're not just around data science and AI, though much of it is. Uh, some of them may be in Python, some in R, some in Scala, uh, but we also have uh, some courses that are available when it comes to emerging technologies like blockchain or chatbots. In fact, there's this really great chatbot course I just wanted to you know, promote. Um, so this is a this is a course that is available to non-programmers and non-coders. So if you're not 
Um, you know, if you're not interested in programming, that's fine. And Python are no problem. You don't need uh, programming at all for this course, but you would be able to add a chatbot to your WordPress website by the end of the course, which would be like mm, three hours, something that you could do on a single you know, day during the weekend. And what you actually end up doing is you, it's, it's a WordPress plugin and you just add in some credentials uh, to your chatbot and then it gets deployed on your WordPress page and uh, you would have that on your website. So um, there we go, I'll give you some time back. Uh, that's my presentation. Yes, questions? Yes. So, um, in, in, enterprise development, okay. in enterprise development projects, normally they're a cross-functional team. So you'll have data scientists, but you'll also have product managers, QA people, UX designers. Mm -hmm. And our observation is that on machine learning driven projects, the way the other people, the non-data scientists have to do their job needs to be different. Mm -hmm. The way you do UX prototyping on an ML project is different, or the way you do testing on an ML project is different. Right. Is this something that you're thinking about in terms of how you train the non-data scientists to do their roles appropriately on data science projects? Absolutely. So uh, a lot of these courses that we have, um, and we're still growing our, our course courses base, um, they are very beginner friendly. So I think a lot of these courses are very approachable if you are coming from a non-technical background who, so, who may not be someone who's working in data science. We have a data science 101 course, we have a you know, basic machine learning course, um, and these are courses that could be applicable to a, a wide variety of different roles that might be involved in the data science team in that kind of ecosystem, but may not be working on the machine learning, let's say, techniques themselves. Um, when it comes to specific kind of roles as well, there's always a potential of you know, taking parts of these courses, customizing in such a way so that they can apply to specific different uh, roles as well. So there's a lot of opportunity there to expand. Okay, any other questions? Colin, thank you so much. Great, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. All right, thanks for your patience. This is a presentation about our team effort here at H2O. We're basically a, a company that does products for machine learning and data science. And our customers are some of those Fortune 500s that you've heard about before. So we deal with them daily and we know what they want, what they need. So the H2O3 product in the last four or five years that we built is a scalable machine learning platform based on Java, so it can handle big data and does like gradient boosting, deep learning, linear models, and so on. And all of that in Spark or in Hadoop environments or the bare bone metal, um, just regular Linux clusters. And this driverless AI here is the latest product that's basically automating Kaggle style uh, feature engineering. So it does more than just machine learning. It, it really does some of the AI that you would say, wow, it's actual AI. It, it, it mimics the brain of a data scientist. And I really encourage you to watch some of these videos of H2O World, our uh, event that we have once a year. There's some really good talks. There's, uh, I think, 43 videos. So these are just some of them. But there's actual good content uh, of, of people leading the field in uh, industry applications. And some of them are financial services. And as you know, Pretty much everybody now has to do investments in AI. PwC is saying that, so it probably is correct. And PwC is also <laughs> working with us. Um, see, they, they, they basically work with us on a automatic tool that figures out issues with like general ledgers, right? So if you have like somebody who's paying somebody every Monday, and suddenly they're paying themselves a million on the Sunday night, you can say, wait a second, something is wrong. So there's some kind of anomaly detection feature engineering that needs to happen, and you can automate those pattern detection uh, recipes if you want. So we worked with them and we got the, uh, some award last year. I think, I forgot what it was called, but something like Audit Innovation of the Year. Yes, here we go. So that was pretty cool. That was one of our vertical applications with a customer. And another one is uh, PayPal. They, they don't talk much about what they exactly they're doing, but they're, they're basically using the tools that we built for themselves to uh, push themselves up the stack uh, against the fraudulent uh, behavior and against churn. Like there's two applications. This is the first one that's churn. So this was a presentation that was in 2015. It's a video on YouTube. So if you just churn, uh, type in churn and H2O or something in, in 
Google, you'll find it. Um, that's a presentation that talks about <coughs> how they're using H2O to do scalable churn detection. So which of their merchants are not going to use PayPal any longer? What was their behavior that led to that? And they used to uh, build models very infrequently because it would take a long time. Back then, they were using R and Python, and it would just take forever. And they're definitely now able to run it on big data. So the ability to run on big data is 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 often important, right? You might think, like you're in either camp. There's two camps. There's one camp that says, oh, I have a terabyte, and I use it all for machine learning. And then we say, well, wait a second. Is that images or text? If not, then you probably have a problem, because you shouldn't be using a terabyte of structured data. There is no terabyte Excel table that's useful, basically, <coughs> unless it has a million features, at which point it's a clickstream at tech uh, data set which is a special case. Anything that has age, income, zip code, this kind of hundreds of columns, you don't really need 10 billion rows. Okay? First of all, there's not that many customers. And if you had that many records of your customers, it probably would be outdated data or I irrelevant data. There's not that much dimensionality in the, in the structure of the data. You don't really need that much. So why do you need big data? Well, they have a lot of data, and they probably have the reason to look at maybe, let's say, 100 million rows or something. We're not talking 10 billion rows. They're just a little bit more than would fit in a regular laptop or a workstation in 2015. So they were able to take the modeling from something like ours with single uh, processor R scripts down to um, Hadoop, 20 nodes, and would model the whole thing in 10 minutes, right? It's just basically a speed up through scale out not necessarily scale up, not a faster note, just 20 crappy notes, but at least you had them and they're cheap. You store your data on the same hardware, you do some compute on it as well. And that's basically what they were able to do. So just, just a regular random forest, nothing fancy, throw all your data in, predict yes or no, churn or not. Now the feature engineering is still important. Of course, we're not talking about that secret sauce that's PayPal's own like you know recipe, how, what kind of features they look at. But in this presentation, I actually give away some of that detail. This is the one that was recently held at uh, H2O World 2017. And this is about fraud. So imagine you are somebody on PayPal uh, using eBay or something to, to buy and sell stuff. So you're shipping it to somebody else. The other person says, OK, nothing in there. The box is empty. They call PayPal or send an email saying, I didn't get anything. OK, PayPal says, sure, here's your money back. Okay. Fine. And then the other guy says, well, I did send it, actually. I, I did send it. Here's proof. See, picture. I took a picture of the box with the item in it. Then, oh, well, uh, what's PayPal going to say now, right? You shipped it. And the other guy said, I never got it. So somehow both parties are right. You can't say you're guilty of illegal actions or something and not pay them. So PayPal just takes a loss. Now, somehow they still have to figure out a way to prevent that, right? Because otherwise we all would just do that all day long and that would be a great business model and we could just be <laughs> retiring soon. So somehow they have to figure out like who is what, doing what, uh, who's under the radar, you know, I do it nine of 10 I do right and then one in 10 I do a hundred bucks here and there and it's always my buddies from high school or something and they're trying to figure out what's happening here. So let's say they have a way to get legally involved and say, hey, you can't do that. Uh, stop doing that. Let's not worry about the legality of it, but the, the technical features. So this is the feature engine that they're <coughs> doing. They're taking the raw features. They're doing some graph-based representation learning. So they're putting the, the who is talking to whom, when, and all that on a graph. They're building features, like how many uh, neighbors am I distant from that person or something through many, how many connections am I connected, what uh, it's the amount of uh, transaction volume in my neighborhood graph and so on. So you can make up some numbers based on that graph. You turn that back into a structured table, Excel style, and then you throw it into driverless AI, which is our latest product that does a little bit more than just a model. It's like a smarter way of a model. It's still a model in the end. It's just a model that has feature pipelines in it. So it does automatic grouping and so on, and um, you know, target encoding and stacking and ensembling, all the stuff that the calculus talk about. And out comes basically a better model, right? And they have something like um, millions of nodes and billions of edges and hundreds of features. So in the end, the data set that they throw into driverless AI, this was just a sample data set for which they showed some, some numbers. But you can see basically the accuracy goes up and then at some point it 
flat lines and whatever here it says what the, the features are that matter. That's kind of the uh, quick preview of the product. And not that it matters here, but they're basically able to make graph-based features and then they're throwing it into a system that squeezes the last bit out of it. And of course, for them, the last bit matters. So in cases like fraud detection, a tenth of a percent is still 10 million or 100 million a month, right? So because that's all that's left. Like if there was zero, you would have no losses. And if there's one tenth of a per mil or whatever, it's still a lot of losses because you have millions and millions of users. So you have to squeeze out every last bit. It's not like, oh yeah, it's flatlining, it's good enough at some point. Like everything matters if you are losing something. It's like a hole in your ship. You don't want a hole, right? You don't want that water to come in. So um, that was that. In general, you know, there's a shortage. Out of the 92 grandmasters in Kaggle, we have four working at H2O right now that are uh, contributing to the logic of the product. And here you can see some of the engineered features. For example, you could say, I do a target encoding of the capital gain, the capital loss, and the education. Those three categorical columns are concatenated together. They're grouped. And then for each of the unique values of those triplets, I compute the mean of the response. In this case, the yes or no, uh, whether I make more than 50,000 or not for the adult data set, which is a classic data set. And I compute that response for each of these groups. But I'm doing out of fault grouping as well so that I don't cheat. So I'm not looking at my group when I compute my mean. I could look at everybody in my kind of group, but not, in, like, not me included, everybody else. And that's a good estimate for my uh, salary, let's say, right? So there's some kind of grouping logic with out of fault, averaging. You have to do noise terms. You have to do uh, smoothing and so on. It's not easy to do this all right. But if you do it right, you get very predictive features that are better than just the raw features. And here another picture. So you can see rate of evidence. You have um, simple, like, uh, dimensionality reduction, truncated SVD, and so on. So things that you could think of as a data scientist, but you might not be able to implement it always, or implement it in a way that's leakage-free and, and has the right validation schemas out of the box. And then there's also interpretation. So you can take your model and ask, why for this observation did I make this prediction? And it gives even English uh, uh, words, basically. It says, because of your age, your probability to churn was 16% higher. And there's also automatic visualization in there. So this can be useful for outlier detection or something. We can automatically find outliers. And this works on a billion rows as well because it's, it's a reduction technique of data that does not sample. So it, it basically makes epsilon environments around each point. And if you're close enough to one other, you get sucked into that bubble. And if not, then you're your own point in that bubble which means every point that's alone will still be there in the end. You just have a bunch of epsilon bubbles left in the end. So there's nobody who gets lost, even though you reduce the, the billion points, let's say, to 10,000. So it's a pretty cool technique. Um, yes, anyway, so there's more you can read about. And the roadmap is pretty cool. So if you have any inputs, if you have any interest what the financial people are more interested in, that's this one here, time series, right? Who here has dealt with time series? Mm -hmm. So anything in the world is time series, right? But some data sets are less time series than others. Like the prediction which cat uh, is like a Siamese cat or something. You just need a picture. Who cares when it was taken? More or less, but still they could like grow over time or something. Everything has a little bit of a time structure in it. But um, and also the, the big data stuff is important for them. So they want multi-node, multi-GPU, everything distributed, scalable, fast. So that's what the financial service companies are interested in. Always the last bit of percent of accuracy and the highest scalability. If you have any questions, now would be a good time. Otherwise, you just go here and um, play around with this. It's actually pretty cool. I would love to have your feedback on this. If you, if you're, if you claim that you're a good data scientist, you should be able to be driverless. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Do you have a mic? Okay, there was a question over there. Oh, sure. Here you go, sir. 
So you had a slide on uh, interpretation, and in talking with finance companies, that's something you hear a lot, is the need for interpretability or explainability. Can, can you just talk about that a little bit more and talk about, you know, there's different definitions of what makes a good explanation. Do you think what you're doing now is sufficient? Does that meet everyone's needs? Is it something you feel like you need to continue to improve? What's missing? That's a very good question. So most financial service companies have some department that really is very well regulated, right? And they need a year to make literally a PhD thesis of a report for every single model they deploy. And they need to write down everything that it does, every reason, every, anything that it decides, why is that? What's the impact of that? Does it use your age or your zip code or not? And so on, it has to be very strict, right? So we cannot satisfy all those requirements. We can just help them get an understanding. Now, what they really want is a GLM, linear model, and 16 coefficients, right, roughly speaking, and those have to be well explained and the most uh, optimal coefficients. But that's not the right answer to do well in terms of decision making, right, because that's a bad decision. It's never going to be as good as a GBM ensemble or a deep learning model or something. So they are struggling with that. So internally, they have way better models than what they're actually using in production, and they're constantly struggling between the two. And we're kind of helping them to get to the other side, but they don't want to come to the other side because they can't, right? There's lawyers involved that say stop. And now either the lawyers have to be overrun because it's worth $10 billion to do the right thing, or they are complying with them and they're just doing the best they can. But for example, if they can't use the age, they might just use the fact whether you play golf or not, right? Which is a very good proxy, but it's not the age. So they're always trying to like trick the system a little bit by finding these proxy features. And it's kind of interesting to watch. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I believe in 10 years from now, things will be different. They probably will be at our cost. So they will be less fair to the average guy, right? It's just going to be, well, sorry, you didn't pay your bill and your, your job isn't really paying that well. So why should I give you a good deal in that insurance uh, you know, service? Things will probably become micro payments too with the blockchain thing and all. As you drive your car, you'll only pay the insurance, for example, while you're driving, when you stop driving, it won't pay anymore. Like everything will become microservice. Hey, can, can I just ask a follow-up question to that? Uh, another thing I hear from financial services company is uh, change control. So with traditional software engineering, if you have a new version, the new version implements a specific set of stories that are written out in Jira somewhere, and you know what they are, you know what the changes are. If you're swapping from a previous model to a new model, it's not implementing a set of requested changes. It's pr probabilistically determined to be better, but it's hard for someone who's not a data scientist to interpret that change. Are, are any of these interpretation techniques helpful for doing comparisons between previous models and new models to help non-data scientists understand the nature of the change? That's something you're working on that I didn't show. It's model management, something like that. We'd be calling it model management. So it's, it's basically, it's supposed to tell you when the model that you have in production is starting to, for example, start to drift slightly because the features are no longer behaving right. So it will tr trigger some kind of flag saying, hey, your age distribution of you know, scoring rows is different than what you trained for, you should retrain. But then you just have a report generated that says that's why we retrained. It doesn't really explain the difference is everywhere, right? It's not easy, like there's an unlimited amount of viewpoints, so it still has to be somewhat specific to the customer to implement those. Is this something that you've already released that you have? Just that's not released, no. Thank you. But that's a lot of work, yeah. It's a right. Okay, any other questions for Arno? No? All right, thank you, Arno. Right. Thank you very much. Anybody have any other questions for Nir or for Tom? Um, I can bring you the mic. Anybody? You ask about um, specific training for non-technical people. So actually at Galvanize, we do provide um, training for non-technical people around uh, data literacy, machine intelligence mindset, um, how to basically translate business problems to data problem. This training is mostly for um, product managers, functional leaders. Um, so yeah, we definitely have it. We, we truly believe that in order to realize the ROI, you don't need to only educate technical people. You also have to educate the non-technical one because sometimes they're actually driving the business forward, right? Not just engineers. 
Um, so it has to go and hand in hand. So just wanted to reply to you. Yeah. Um, so, so another thing you said in your presentation was the importance of the middleman role to bridge the gap between technical and non-technical. And so the questions are, are you seeing organizations start to put people into those roles? And what kind of title do they give them? What kind of background do those people have? Where do they find them? Yeah, so basically, call it the data translator. Um, that's one of the names that few organization gave. Um, it's, yeah, it's, you know, the data steward, I heard, the data science analyst. So basically, these people, and if you actually look at LinkedIn, you can actually monitor that, see over time, there is a massive um, growth. Uh, in, in, you know, it, companies want to, to recruit these people. So these people have a little bit of programming experience, um, a little bit math and stuff. So these are kind of like, uh, tech savvy people or uh, you know people that are not data scientists but mainly like data analysts so they can actually you know think about data analysts these are people that knows the business objectives um, and at the same time they can just help you know holding the hand for the data scientists just you know how to get the data how to translate the business problems into data problems and then the data scientists can actually pick it up from there and do the modeling um, so this is kind of like the middleman's organizations are all about it, like most of our, actually most of our corporate trainings with very, very large enterprises is around this, what they call the data science 201, kind of like the middleman. Um, you know, very, it's, it's massive and it's actually gonna grow even in the future as organizations actually realizing that this is a path moving forward to realize the ROI behind AI, yeah. So that's definitely a very strong trend, yeah, of course. Someone else? Or questions? Yeah. I have a question that anyone can answer, any three of you. Um, thank you. Um, the question is, so I know that there's a lot of conversation about how to leverage data that already exists within an organization, so that's a great starting point. But some organizations that are thinking about the future of where things are going also need, it seems like they need help also collecting data effectively enough to be able to then really achieve what they're trying to achieve long term. So are you seeing a lot of that kind of help and support that people are asking for as well? So not just, hey, can you come in and help us figure out how to currently use our data sets, but oh, by the way, we should also identify how to best capture the data. So obviously in, in healthcare, a lot of people are trying to use it with sensors, but in other industries, um, you know, I'm just sort of curious to see what you guys are seeing. companies trying to figure out how to be strategic about data, right? This is all about treating data as a strategic asset, right? Not what you only currently have, how you actually enhance what you have with, you know, data from the future, right? So I think companies are actually strategic about it. The problem is all the data engineering stuff, not always in the right place, right? How you get the data, how you put it in the right place, how you store it smart and efficient so you can actually deploy the data further on. So I think companies are actually quite creative about how to get data outside of what they have, especially if we talk about Fortune 500 companies. Average spending on buying data is around $6 million a year. So they can actually get more data, more futuristic data. Uh, the thing is that what we try to do now is help them figure out how to use what they have currently because they don't do that, right? So how about you start with leveraging what you have and then try to, you know, with that forecast the future, right? Look about, think about, okay, this is what I have, these are the predictions that I have, the future might look like that, and then enhance the data with some other stuff that um, they can get from outside or, you know, create proxies for data um, that might relate to the future, yeah. yeah. There's also a lot of opportunity wasted because companies have data exhaust, right? Like, you know, tell company you might know how much people are willing to pay, but you don't you don't take their offer because they want the other hotel or something, and whatever they bid for your hotel, you would have known, and you could have told the whole world, all the other financial institutions would have loved to know how much you're willing to spend, but you didn't give them that data exhaust. So the ability to trade data between companies, I think, has to grow as well, because you don't have to find all the gold yourself, basically. Uh, yeah, sure. 
Um, I, so, so I think at least for most of the clients that we've worked with, um, like you said, uh, many clients have that problem where they don't realize they already have a lot of data, and uh, trying to find that insight from the data is from their existing data, um, and trying to gather from different sources from within the organization. Uh, I can tell you from within IBM, it can be tricky. Um, and even uh, within a large organization like IBM, um, there are times where we're not collecting data where we should be. And it's, um, so we talked a little bit about you know, the uh, people and culture perspective. Um, it's not actually just management, it's the entire company too, I think. Um, and it's on me, especially as a data scientist in a, in a large organization, to, to raise my concerns up the chain so that you know, the, the leadership team can effectively you know, drive decisions through data. So um, I think it works uh, in all sorts of different directions, yeah. And by the way, I'm not going to talk about it right now, but I think also blockchain will change the way we democratize data. And this will massively kind of like disturb like the amount of data that companies have and the outside data that they can actually relate to to actually create predictive power. So um, it's going to be very interesting. It's already interesting, but it's going to be even more interesting in the upcoming years. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Any more questions? All right. So thank you for coming for Galvanize. We were happy to host you here. And um, see you around. <laughs>